All right, you guys, this episode of Paradigm Profiles is called Ambushed in Elmwood. In January 2007, five Sureño gang members were arrested in Mountain View, California for a slew of crimes. Law enforcement dubbed Ramon Pinot Ortiz, Alan Colitas Martinez, Juan A. Ball Luna, Ricardo Stranger Fitz, and Carlos Little Sharky Barrera, the zip tie robbers, because their modus operandi included using zip ties to bind their victims during these robberies. Although this group was considered young and at the beginning of their criminal careers, the thing that stood out about them was that they were extremely violent, organized, and considerably seasoned gang members. Stranger, A-Ball, and Peanut had already done time in state prison and were the three influencers who led the other two on this crime spree. The purported leader, Peanut, implemented policies and delegated specific responsibilities to each of the five members. He delegated a point man who was responsible for the group's security and the specific task of detecting the presence of law enforcement during their crime spree. A primary getaway driver was selected who was used to drive to and from target locations. The getaway driver was also tasked with burning and destroying the vehicle if they ever encountered a situation where the vehicle had to be abandoned or destroyed. Peanut also appointed shooters who were responsible for carrying weapons and maintaining the group's safety during their crimes. The group also entered into a pact and had a sworn blood oath to each other, vowing not to ever speak to any law enforcement if they were ever caught or arrested. These guys didn't operate by chance or opportunity. They invested a substantial amount of time casing out potential target locations and watching the day-to-day activities of the establishments they targeted. Once they had cased out a business establishment that they determined was a good hit, they go in and perform what is described as a takedown robbery. This is when a crew of robbers goes into an establishment and shakes up the business and its customers preying on the element of surprise. It's done quick and it's done under the threat of force, violence, and intimidation. The perpetrators go in and assert complete dominance and control over the employees and customers by laying them down and by usually corralling them into an area where they can be watched. In this case, these guys went in, asserted their control over everyone, and then used a signature practice of utilizing zip ties to bind and mobilize their victims. Like I said, it's rare that a street gang operated with the level of sophistication that these guys did especially when they're not connected or working with a criminal organization like the Mexican Mafia or the Nuestra Familia. Don't get me wrong, you've got some street-level criminals that know how to use their heads for more than just hat racks. But the reality of this is that the average gang member just isn't that sophisticated or organized when it comes to the criminal element. I think it's safe to assume that some of this sophistication was attained while Peanut, Stranger, and 8-Ball were in prison. These three definitely had all the influence, and this wasn't only attributed to the fact that they were the ones who had already done state time, but it was also solidified by the fact that Stranger and A-Ball were also blood cousins. This is also something that I personally took notice of with respects to my own level of sophistication after going to prison myself, or should I say, my own lack of sophistication. I spoke on this in one of my previous profiles. Before I went to prison, I was gangbanging out on the streets like a typical gangbanger. There wasn't nothing sophisticated or notable about the things I was doing. It was typical. I wasn't implementing any level of planning. There was no real strategy or tactics when it came to how I would engage with opposition. Most of the time, we pull up, jump out with weapons, and go at it. That was it. Like I said, it was typical gangbanging and it was practically predictable. We might try to catch the opposition slipping and we might try to gain some type of advantage, but other than that, there was no real planning or strategy about it. Now after I went to prison and was exposed to some of the NR indoctrination, more specifically the street schooling, i.e. how to detect threats and flush out the opposition, how to engage threats, infiltration tactics, street gang warfare tactics, how to utilize street gangs to combat enemy gang warfare, etc., etc. Once I had been exposed to this type of schooling, it changed my mentality. It changed my whole way of thinking, and this translated to how I began operating on the streets. Now I was planning and strategizing. I was implementing three and four way strike zones, flushing out the opposition, flanking and using decoys. These are things I never would have thought about doing myself, so prison definitely had an impact on what I was doing out there. 
Even though none of these guys were clicked up, I'm sure they still got laced up and were exposed to some level of schooling. The crime spree that these Mountain View natives were involved in didn't just include crimes committed in Mountain View either. They covered a vast area throughout Santa Clara County. They hit licks in Mountain View, San Jose, Cupertino, East Palo Alto, Sunnyvale, Saratoga, and other small towns in between. In fact, their crimes were caught on several surveillance camera systems and there were several eyewitnesses that claimed that they had seen these crimes as they were being committed. According to some of those eyewitnesses accounts and based on observing their interactions, they described Pina as assuming some type of leadership position and that he clearly exerted influence over the others. In other words, Pina had obviously appeared to be acting as the group's leader or shot caller. At any rate, after having committed several of these takedown style robberies over the course of several months, their luck would finally run out in January of 2007. After authorities received several tips and after conducting an extensive investigation, Mountain View PD and San Jose PD put together a task force that was specifically tasked with taking down and arresting the perpetrators who were responsible for committing these robberies. Law enforcement began to worry about the group who were committing these crimes because it seemed as if they were becoming more brazen and more desperate with each passing incident. When these five individuals were subsequently arrested, they were all taken to the Santa Clara County Jail and booked for numerous felonies related to their crime spree. And because they were all documented gang members, they were all charged with gang enhancements for every felony that was charged. That was the beauty of catching these cases in Santa Clara County. Maybe they didn't know, or maybe someone should have told them. But this is standard practice in Santa Clara County. If you even look like a gang member and you catch a felony in that county, you can count on getting hit with complimentary gang enhancements, compliments of the Santa Clara County District Attorney's Office. If they would have got arrested in another county like San Francisco, San Mateo, Alameda, or maybe even Sonoma, they might not have gotten hit with gang enhancements. But again, that's the beauty of getting caught up in Santa Clara County. So once the task force effectuated the arrest, and these guys were transported to the county jail for booking. This is where things began to take a turn for the worse in regards to Alan Colitas Martinez. His status with the rest of his crew fell into question after there was speculation going around that he may have been cooperating and that he had made statements to the investigating detectives. He did in fact make statements and he was cooperating, but this was where the story takes an anonymous turn and this is where the Santa Clara County District Attorney's Office dropped the ball. Before I get into the facts and the details of this case, let me just say this. Despite the fact that Colitas decided to cooperate, nobody was supposed to know about this, especially his co-defendants. He did this with the understanding that he would be doing so as a confidential informant and as a potential future cooperator who might possibly testify later when the case went to trial. There wasn't even a proffer agreement. He had just basically made some incriminating statements in the presence of some of the investigating detectives as a good faith offer to prove he was willing to help them with the case and that was it. It was off the cuff and when you have a percipient witness who incriminates himself and makes a good faith showing that he's willing to cooperate and that he's trying to establish some credibility, it's on those detectives and the district attorney to protect the identity and well-being of that individual. That didn't happen here. I'll go into all the details about how this information was disseminated later, but for the sake of giving you the full story as it happened, let me just walk you through how everything transpired from the point after these guys were arrested. While these guys were going through the motions of getting booked and transported to the jail, the purported leader, Peanut, reminded the others of the pact that they had all entered into and the severity of the consequences for anyone who cooperated or broke this pact. He basically reiterated to them all, to hold their mud and to not make any statements to the arresting detectives. This was obviously said because he either sent something he didn't like or he had some type of concerns about one or some of them remaining loyal. Either way, he wanted this to resonate amongst all five of them. When these guys were finally transported to the county jail to be booked, they were all ran through the normal intake process that consisted of getting fingerprinted, having their booking pictures taken, undergoing a medical evaluation, and finally getting classified and housed by the jail's classification unit. Due to all five of these guys being documented as active Sureño street gang members, 
They were all housed in M4D, located at the Elmwood facility. Keep in mind, Santa Clara County Jail is one of the biggest county jails in Northern California. It's broken up into three facilities. You have the new jail and the old jail located in downtown San Jose. And then you have the Elmwood facility that's located in Milpitas. Peanut, A-Ball, Stranger, Colitas, and Little Sharky were all housed in M4D. This is a dorm or pod that exclusively houses Sureños only. I believe they are the only group segment that are housed alone exclusively and this is done due to enemy concerns and other issues involving compatibility. These guys will remain here housed in M4D until an incident would later occur on September 11, 2007. From January until September of 2007, the detectives overseeing the case moved forward with their investigation and this included generating new police reports that documented details of some of the robberies that they had allegedly committed. During this time, they also had several court appearances that basically only consisted of getting bound over to Superior Court and all the formalities of making the initial municipal court appearances. When some of the initial police reports came out per standard discovery requirements, they apparently documented whether or not any of these five individuals gave statements and whether they even agreed to be interviewed by law enforcement. The only one who agreed to sit down for an interview and provide a statement was Alan Colitas Martinez. The statements that were reflected in the police reports were generic in terms of implicating anyone specifically, but what they did clearly do is they corroborated the identities of all five of these guys, putting them at some of the scenes of the crimes and there was also minor cooperation with respects to some of the things that were seen on the surveillance footage. This might seem minor in terms of what people might think implicates someone, but these are also people who don't understand the politics of the G-Code and gang protocol. You're never supposed to agree to sit down and hold dialogue with the same police who are spearheading an investigation against you and the homies, and you're never allowed to make statements or references about others who have committed crimes with you. It doesn't matter how trivial or minor someone might think it is, it's never allowed and you're going to have a hard time justifying why you agreed to do something like that. Whenever the district attorney releases discovery that might tend to put someone's safety in jeopardy, especially in gang cases, they have a fundamental responsibility to advise not only the defendant's counsel, but they're also supposed to notify jail staff that there's someone who may potentially be in danger. Regardless to how minor they may think it is, they're supposed to make that notification. At that point, it's then in the hands of jail staff, more specifically the gang intel officers and the classification unit to make a conscious decision based on the totality of the circumstances, i.e. who's involved, what's contained in the information, the level of threat involving the inmate or inmates and the political makeup of the group involved. Because all these things are important. Any deviation in this process could result in dire consequences. It could lead to a stabbing, a slashing, or even a homicide. In this case, the district attorney should have notified the jail that Colitas was possibly in danger based on his own statements and based on the fact that there were police reports disseminated exposing the statements that he made to law enforcement. Between January and May of 2007, Peanut, Eight Ball, Stranger, and Little Sharky obviously stumbled across information that was detrimental towards Colitas. Whether it was based solely on the aforementioned police reports or something else, they seen something that concerned them about Colitas possibly providing information to law enforcement. It could have been a number of things. One of the criminal defense attorneys could have floated a theory about the possibility of Colitas cooperating, as they often do. More damaging and incriminating statements could have been released one of the detectives could have dropped a bone, or the most likely scenario, these guys just started tasting blood. They ran with it, and Colitas ended up on the menu. Now, what I'm about to tell you wasn't known until later on in the investigation, but apparently, Peanut, A-Ball, and Stranger had formulated plans to kill Colitas originally in May of 2007. Now, Little Sharky wasn't involved at that time, as him and Colitas were still close friends. Peanut was allegedly the one instigating the plot against Colitas, and he was the one who continued to press the others about the need to deal with them. As far as he was concerned, he had nothing to lose by catching another case either way. 
Aside from his legal problems in Santa Clara County, he also had pending cases in San Mateo in Alameda County for 664-187, attempted murder, and 187, murder. So sometime in May of 2007, Peanut devised a plan to hit Colitas, but the plan was aborted at the last minute due to a riot that escalated in M4D. As a result of the riot, the unit was placed on lockdown, which confined all the inmates to their cells. This limited the movement of all the inmates in the dorm, so Peanut and his three constituents decided to delay the hit until a later date. The riot had nothing to do with these guys or the plans that they were making. Coincidentally, it escalated over some of the inmates complaining that the jail wasn't giving them what they had coming. So they decided to take a unified stand. As September got closer, Peanut started floating the idea of rehashing his plan on September 11th. There was speculation about whether or not he was targeting this date so it would be done in conjunction with the whole 9-11 thing. But again, this was speculation. He started planting the seed in the minds of the others. The case was moving through the courts and he expressed urgency that something needed to be done before Colitas possibly locked it up and was used as a percipient witness in court. The others began to buy into Pina's propaganda about how it would have dire consequences on them if that happened in the courts. They bought into it hook, line, and sinker. And because he started using this theory to ignite the rest of them, final preparations started being implemented on September 9th and 10th. Every opportunity Peanut got so that he could talk to Little Sharky, Stranger, and Eight Ball alone, he took full advantage of it. Whenever Colitas was in the shower, on the phone, at a visit, or distracted, Peanut would pull these guys aside so that they could finalize their plans. One of the other advantages that Peanut exploited was the fact that he was sellies with Colitas. This gave him ample opportunity to make him feel at ease and to dispel any suspicion or doubts that he was in questionable standings. It also gave Peanut the ability to set Colita's mind at ease, or like they say, to rock him to sleep. So on the 9th and 10th of September, they put their plan in motion. All the things that they had talked about were coming to fruition. Each one of them had a role and they all did their part to make it happen. The plan was for them to create a ruse during the hours when the unit's locked down and everyone's in their cells so that they can perform an institutional count. Eight Ball and Little Sharky would act as if they were being invited into the cell with Peanut and Colitas so they could all play cards and socialize. This is common practice amongst inmates in jail or in prison. Sometimes during count or during shift change, someone might sneak into someone else's cell to either get tattoo work done, to drink pruno, or to just kick it with their homies. So, it's common, and this wouldn't have raised any red flags for Colitas. He would have just looked at it as if the homies wanted to kick it in the cell between count time. But for good measure, and to make sure that nothing went wrong, A-Ball and Little Sharky dummied up their bunks to make it appear as if they were asleep in their cells. This was to give off the impression and appearance that they were in their cells asleep in case the tear officer looked in during count time. Stranger was delegated to act as the lookout. They all agreed that he didn't need to be in the cell with the rest of them and that he could act as their ears and eyes. His cell was in an area that was kitty corner to the cell they were in and it was located in an area that would have gave him a clear vantage point of the front of the unit. This means he would have been able to see anyone coming in or leaving. The last part of their ominous plan including making sure that they had a plastic garbage bag in the cell with them. This was going to be used to serve as a diabolical tool of death to smother the life out of Colitas until he couldn't breathe anymore and until their sinister plan was carried out. According to several Sureños and a confidential informant that were all housed in M4D on the day of the incident, the foregoing events transpired on September 11, 2007. Later on, during the investigative stages of this case, the investigators concluded that all the inmates in the dorm obviously knew what was about to happen as these guys put certain individuals on notice that they were going to hit Colitas and that they were probably going to be on lockdown as a result of what was going to go down. This was corroborated after the jail's gang intel unit listened to several jail recorded phone calls and heard inmates allude to them possibly going on lockdown because of something that was about to happen. The only incident that transpired after these calls took place was the incident involving Colitas.
So at around 10.30 a.m., Eight Ball and Little Sharky dummied up their bunks and ducked into the cell occupied by Peanut and Colitas. While they were setting the trap for Colitas and getting ready to make themselves invisible, Stranger was getting himself in a position and making sure he had a clear view at not only the cell that his four co-defendants were in, but also the front gate where the floor officer would have had to enter the unit. Once the floor officer conducted his count and left the unit, Peanut pulled out a deck of playing cards and invited the others to play a game of spades. Of course, this was all part of the ruse, and this was nothing more than a way to keep Colitas distracted. As the game commenced, Peanut told Colitas to occasionally get up and check the door, meaning to keep checking to see if the floor officer had come. As they continued to play spades, the tension grew in the cell. Eight Ball, Little Sharky, and Peanut knew that it was going to be go time any minute but each one waited for someone else to initiate the attack. As Colitas got up to check the window, he stood at the door scanning the pod, clearly oblivious to what was happening behind him. He had allowed himself to be led right into their trap. His mistake was placing his trust and his loyalty into those who were supposed to be his brothers, his own homeboys. Like so many other young gang members before him, Colitas made the critical mistake of trusting those who he allowed to get the closest. They say keep your friends close and your enemies closer. I'm not sure I agree with that adage. We allow ourselves to buy into the propaganda, all the glitter and pizzazz that the gang lifestyle is supposed to entail. We're often blinded and hoodwinked by the luminosity and prestige of living that gangster lifestyle. Despite seeing others before us fall victim to the charades, the shams, the smoke screens, and the fake sense of belonging to something righteous, we still readily buy into all the hype and let ourselves be walked right off the edge of a cliff. Some of us see the writing on the wall and spend years sleepwalking before we decide to shake ourselves out of it. Unfortunately, there just so happens to be more like Olitas that are willing to invest their trust and loyalty into the so-called brotherhood than there is guys who are lucky enough to see it for what it is. Colitas would go down as one of them, and he'd literally take his last few breaths looking into the eyes of betrayal, duplicity, and deception. As Colitas was standing at the window with his back turned, Apol and Little Sharky rushed him from the back and slammed his face into the door. Before Colitas could respond, Peanut pulled his legs from up under him and slammed him face down on the floor. Once they got him down on the floor, Peanut straddled his back and basically used his weight to pin him down. In stature, Eight Ball and Little Sharky were both small guys. They stood about 5'5 five five and both weighed about a buck fifty soaking wet. But Peanut, on the other hand, was stocky and weighed a solid 240 pounds. One can only imagine what kinds of thoughts must have been going through Colitas' head as they were pinning him down on the ground and as all this was happening. At first, he probably just assumed he was in a bad situation and that he was probably going to get a good beat down. And even then, he probably didn't even know what it was about. But I'm sure panic set in when he seen the black plastic bag and they began to wrap it around his head. No doubt he pleaded and begged with them to stop, but this fell on deaf ears. It took less than three minutes to smother the life out of Colitas. According to their own statements, Little Sharky and Eight Ball each held a leg while Peanut straddled him and smothered him with the black bag. Other inmates who were housed in close proximity to the murder said they heard muffled noises coming from the cell. It sounded like these guys were wrestling. Somebody else said it sounded like someone was in pain and it sounded like someone was moaning. In the end, Colitas died from manual asphyxiation. The medical examiner's report would later show that the bag was held so tight across Colitas' face that the inside of his lips were tore up from his teeth. Once it was official that Colitas was deceased, the other three placed his body on the bottom bunk and draped a blanket over him to give off the impression that he was asleep. After they placed the body on the bunk, they would end up having to stay in the cell for another two hours before count cleared and the unit opened back up for normal program. Now, the following information is no added preservatives or additives to beef up this story. I don't add no tapatio to these stories. This is all public knowledge for anyone who cares to look into it themselves. The following information came to light through Little Sharky and another confidential informant who would later materialize during the court proceedings. A-Ball was either into necrophilia or was at the very least curious about it because during the two hours that these guys were stranded in the cell with Colitas' dead body, 
He allegedly made references about wanting to have sex with the dead body. Now, I'm just gonna say this. Being sick in the mind is one thing, but necrophilia is sick on another level. There's nothing funny about that. Even if he was playing, they should have stomped that fool out just for saying something like that. Because although this is only my opinion, anyone sick enough to do something like that has the potential to do some way out shit. The others at least had the decency to tell that fool to stand down, but I still think he should have got stomped the fuck out just based on the fact that he exposed himself and just for suggesting something as sinister as that. Later on that same day, the CEO who oversees the unit came in and opened up the dorm for his routine afternoon program. This is when 8-Ball and Little Sharky snuck back out of the cell and blended in with the rest of the dorm. So for the next three hours, the dorm operates like it did every other day. Inmates were taking showers, watching TV, playing cards, and just milling around like they did whenever they came out of their cells. Meanwhile, the body remained in the cell, and this was something that the entire dorm was aware of. Allegedly, some inmates were even walking by the cell and looking in just to see if they could get a glimpse of the dead body. Initially, nothing about that day appeared to be any different with the exception of an ominous quietness that fell over the entire unit. It's not the normal kind of quietness with respects to the noise level. It's an eerie kind of quietness that only those who have done time can understand. Some of the veteran officers that have worked in those type of jail and prison environments have also learned how to key in on these types of things as well. Like they say, it's the quiet after the storm. This happens when someone's about to get hit, after someone's been hit, or when someone gets knocked down like Olitas did. When something like this happens, you can see it in the way inmates move. After you've done time in prison, you can read the yard when something like this happens. It's like everybody knows what happened, but they try to act like everything's normal. And trust me, inmates are some of the worst actors ever. They'll give themselves up most of the time if you just sit back and observe their movements. At some point, when they were preparing evening chow, Peanut came out and approached the CO about concerns he had with respects to his celly. He told the CO that his celly wouldn't wake up and that he hadn't responded to him since he went to sleep earlier in the day. It was at this point that the CO entered the cell to check on Colitas and observed him laying on his bunk. The CO vigorously tried waking him up, but this was to no avail. After trying several different ways to stimulate some life back in the colitas, the CO finally called for medical staff and backup to respond. I think this should have raised suspicion myself because a 19 year old kid doesn't just drop dead and stop breathing. Nonetheless, after the CO hit his panic button and summoned for assistance, it was probably less than a minute before the unit was flooded with COs, medical staff, supervisors, and jail brass. Ironically, nothing about this situation seemed to be amiss about the circumstances and nobody suspected foul play yet. Next to respond was the Milpitas Fire Department and the local ambulance. Despite being told that jail staff and medical crews did attempt to revive Colitas, ambulance personnel in the fire department made their own attempts per standard protocol. And of course, this was also to no avail. Minutes after they made their attempt, Colitas was officially pronounced dead on the scene. The cause was still unknown at that point, but later on, during the autopsy, the medical examiner noted petechia in his eyes, across his throat, and his torso. The tiny brown purple spots are due to bleeding under the skin and can be attributed to trauma. The location of the petechia is indicative of pressure and or compression, which strongly suggested suffocation. This is what they ultimately concluded happened to Colitas. Within an hour, suits and ties that included investigators from the District Attorney's Office and Santa Clara County Sheriff's Office, homicide detectives, and other entities flooded the dorm, and they went about the usual process of interviewing each inmate at their window and collecting their statements. Most inmates dummied up, claiming that they hadn't seen or heard anything. One inmate, on the other hand, was taking notes and gathering as much information as he possibly could. This would end up being devastating for those who perpetrated the murder and revealed some of the intimate details. After this incident took place, classification elected to move Peanut, 8-Ball, Stranger, and Little Sharky to the sixth floor in the main jail. 8-Ball and Stranger were housed together while Peanut and Sharky were split up. So between September 11, 2007 up until June of 2008, 8-Ball and Stranger were befriended by another Sureño inmate 
who was housed with them on the sixth floor. This individual managed to gain their trust and basically got them to talk about some of the intimate details that only the killers would have known about. Details that the media hadn't released and details that purposely weren't released by the investigating officers. This is what buried them. The unidentified inmate told investigators that he wanted to cooperate but was fearful for his family's safety if they found out he provided information. This confidential informant also indicated that Peanut, A-Ball, and Stranger were down for the cause and that none of them had a problem with taking a life sentence. Furthermore, he stated that Little Sharky was just terrified of the other three and that this is the only reason he won't talk. At any rate, about a month after Colitas was killed, Little Sharky was rushed and beaten up out on the sun deck. Like all removals, they made him feel comfortable, they preyed on his trust, and then they blasted him. Whether they had suspicions about him possibly cooperating or whether they just thought he was a weak link, they decided he had to go. The only positive thing about it was that they elected not to use a weapon, it was just hands on. Later, during an interview, Little Sharky explained why he was beaten up by the other Sureños. He claimed he was beaten up because he was dropping out of the Sureños and that he didn't want to associate with them anymore. Apparently, he must have communicated this to other Sureños or he somehow gave them this impression because this isn't something that's just assumed. During this same interview, detectives who were investigating Colitas' murder attempted to ask Little Sharky about the details of the incident, but he dummied up and denied involvement. However, by all indications, it was obvious that he wanted to talk and that the only reason he didn't is because he feared that his family would be subjected to retribution if he did. This was exacerbated by the fact that Peanut and Little Sharky's families lived in the same neighborhood. On several occasions during the interview, he stated, they know where my family lives and they'll kill them if they find out I gave up information. At one point, Little Sharky and Colitas were very close. When they operated as a crew during their crime spree on the streets, these two were practically best friends. When investigators continued to press Little Sharky about what happened to Colitas and showed him pictures of the dead body, he almost broke down several times and had to fight back the tears. He couldn't look at the pictures and just kept saying that this used to be his close friend. Despite these statements and other incriminating statements that were provided by the jailhouse confidential informant, Eight Ball and Stranger went to trial and were found not guilty. Little Sharky was never even charged. Even though he participated in the murder, investigators recognized that he was under duress, that he wasn't a principal figure in the case, and the fact that he was assaulted also factored in, so he basically got a freebie. Peanut, on the other hand, claimed that he killed Colitas himself and that he acted alone. He had nothing to lose based on the fact that he was fighting other homicide cases out of Alameda and San Mateo counties as well. Peanut ultimately ended up getting sentenced to LWAP and is currently housed in Pleasant Valley State Prison. Stranger ended up getting sentenced to 30 plus years for his involvement in the group's crime spree. So although Stranger and A-Ball managed to win a small victory in getting a not guilty verdict in Colitas' murder, they still got strung out with long 30 plus year prison sentences for their involvement in the crime spree. Stranger is currently housed in Soledad State Prison and is eligible for parole on January 4th, 2030. A-Ball is currently being housed in Pelican Bay State Prison and is eligible for parole on December 15th, 2030. Little Sharky has already been released. He was housed in High Desert State Prison before paroling sometime in December of 2020. This case illustrates all the ills, the perils, the backbiting, the backstabbing, and the deceptive tactics that are part of this lifestyle. One has to wonder, or should wonder, why was a 19-year-old kid celled up with an experienced 30-year-old gang leader who was fighting multiple murder charges in other counties? Well, I guess it really shouldn't come as any real surprise, because that's what they do. You don't get to pick and choose who you're celled up with when you go to jail or prison. So, let this be a lesson to some of you youngsters that might think, Going to jail or prison is cool. One day you could end up in a cell with someone who's got nothing to lose. Someone who's already looking at life and who might even be looking for a way to catch another body. Trust me, I've seen this happen before. This was Colitas' first arrest. In most jails, they operate under a classification system that separates the more seasoned and hardened inmates from those who are considered less violent and who don't have extensive or long violent histories. Colitas and Peanut probably shouldn't have been sold up together. 
But again, there's a lot of variables that are involved and inmate safety isn't always the priority or at the forefront of their agenda. The DA and the officers overseeing this case dropped the ball. They immediately failed to notify the jail that Colitas was in danger. The DA is responsible for that. They have a fundamental obligation to reach out and advise the jail about potential risks such as this. The fact that this didn't happen was a failure and a breakdown in the process. A 19-year-old kid loses his life at the hands of those who I'm sure he trusted the most. Like other young gang members, I'm sure he glorified that lifestyle. I'm sure he had aspirations to be a big homie, to elevate himself within that lifestyle, and to continue on building his criminal career. There's a lot of lessons to learn from a story like this. Some of these lessons are some of the usual lessons that we've all seen and heard before. There's a lot of us who have invested all our trust, loyalty, and honor in because we're caught up in the prestige and prominence of the cause, what it stands for, what it represents, and how we are investing our loyalty in the people who a lot of us genuinely love. But take a minute and think about that. Is it the people who were raised and brought up on the soil of Northern California, or is it the familia? I'm sure some of you will say the familia, but if that's your answer, you're not being true to yourself. Most of you didn't even know what the familia was, what it represented, or what it was about until we landed in prison and it became mandatory. The reality of it is that most of you developed a strong unbreakable affinity for the people who came up on Northern California soil, our hood, our real homeboys who we broke bread with and who we really wanted to see get somewhere in life. Homeboys that wanted to see you excel in life and who would also give you the tools and game to do it. Not your supposed brothers in crime who are gonna help you find a thousand different ways to spend the rest of your life in prison and then actually make you believe that it was for a worthy purpose. Wake up, Rasa. The writing's been on the wall. And this is not about North or South, because for the brothers from Southern California, the same lesson applies. A lot of them grew up loving their hood and those who were raised on Southern California soil. They had no knowledge or concept about the AMA either. Prison and jail ended up being the extension of it. This is where these criminal organizations have been so effective in spreading their propaganda. The point is, we grew up with a strong sense of pride, love, and respect for our gente. Whether it was from Northern California or Southern California, it's all the same. 19 year old kid shouldn't have died with a black plastic bag wrapped around his head and his so-called homies pinning him down to ensure that he takes his last breath of air. I don't care how you spin it or how your belief system is wired, there's something seriously wrong with that picture. You can't fault people for being equipped with survival abilities, self-preservation, the will to live, the will to be free, the will to prosper, etc, etc. We're just not wired like that. The criminal belief system is marred, flawed, and fraught with self-deception. You're led to believe that somehow self-destruction or leading yourself to an inglorious end, an end where you believe that spending the rest of your life in prison is somehow an honorable thing to do. That you should lay your life down for the purpose of preserving a criminal organization is a righteous thing. Would you instill this belief system in your kid? Would you define honor like this? Maybe you would, maybe you wouldn't. We all make choices and we all have to be accountable for those choices. There's a big world out there. A world that most of you haven't even seen a fraction of. Prison is for the birds. There's absolutely nothing to gain from it. Unless your aspirations only go as far as holding some status on a prison yard or possibly even being a leader or a principal figure within the leadership circles. Give yourselves a chance. Go see what the world has to offer out there. It's those that you allow to get the closest who are going to do you. In the end, they're the ones who are going to stick a knife in your back because they can. They've already disarmed you by gaining your trust. Hopefully, there's some youngsters out there who will learn something from this, even if it's just one of the tactics that was used to get you alone in a cell somewhere like what happened here with Colitas. Like the old adage goes, the saddest thing about betrayal is that it never comes from your enemies. It always comes from your friends, those in your own circle, and those who you allow to get the closest. I hope you guys have enjoyed this episode of Paradigm Profiles. I'm already working on the next profile, so barring nothing crazy happening over the course of this next week, it should be released by the weekend. Inner Demons will start back up this week. I'm not going to go into the details, but I got really sick these past couple of weeks and ended up in the hospital. 
And again, after all that preaching I did about procrastinating and lagging when it comes to your health issues, I created a bigger problem for myself that probably wouldn't have escalated the way it did. We fell off these last couple of weeks and haven't put out nearly half as much content that I would have liked to. All I can say is that we're going to bounce back and get right back on track. Whether it was behind personal issues, behind life's everyday problems, or just behind other things, we lost our footing. But it isn't the first and it won't be the last. I've been on since 2017, then transitioned to Paradigm Media News in 2019. So I've been here for the long haul and I'm going to continue pushing. Longevity is something that not too many channels can say they have under their belts. So trust me, we ain't going nowhere and we still have a lot of work to put in. I'm going to get back to doing what I used to do, dropping these types of profiles along with the Q&As and other content. Inner Demons is barely taking off, so we have a lot to cover. At any rate, we want to extend our appreciation and gratitude to those of you who have continued to support the channel, as well as those of you who continue to push that positive line. Live every day like it's your last. Hold your loved ones close and make best of the time you still have left with them. You're blessed because there's some of us who are no longer that fortunate. Again, we appreciate you guys, the viewers, because without you, we would cease to exist.